Hello, and welcome to Virtual Victorian Days. I know things are a little strange this year. I miss seeing you all on the green, but I am super stoked to be here online for the very first Virtual Victorian Days. So hello, my name is Sandy Roberts, and I am a STEM educator, and I'm kind of your steampunk scientist for the weekend. Um, I have lots of fun planned. We've got four different presentations on science from the Victorian era, and um, I'm hoping that that you'll come and visit me for each of them. Today, we're doing paper phonographs. So we're gonna learn about sound. We're gonna learn some of the history of audio technology from the Victorian age. Before we get started, real quick, I should introduce myself. Um, my name, as I said, is Sandy Roberts. I am the owner of Kaleidoscope Enrichment. So I do science, technology, engineering, art, math, and maker programs all over the area and well, now online. <laughs> so I am also the makerspace coordinator for the Warren County Library System. So you may have met me at the Southwest branch over in Stewartsville or one of the other branches doing all kinds of fun projects. And hopefully we'll be able to do that again soon. But in the meantime, you can find all of my cool stuff online for free. Um, if this is not enough for you, if you're looking for more projects, I know a lot of us are at home. We've got kind of interesting educational situations right now. Um, I am also the author of the Big Book of Maker Camp Projects, which has over 100 different items uh, and activities that you can do, including fun cosplay activities like this. So um, please be sure to check that out. It's with McGraw-Hill. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, wherever you like to get your books. And I will just give a shout out to the Sock and Puppet Company over in Easton. They carry my book and they're my favorite independent bookstore in the area so far. I heard a couple more have opened. Um, all right, so why don't we get started? Um, you are going to need as materials after our little discussion, some very simple stuff. You're gonna need a piece of paper, um, a couple of needles or pins, a bit of tape, and you're gonna want to find a record. Maybe one that you aren't really attached to. I actually do love this record, but my kids got a handle on it years ago and it's not in great shape anymore. So we are actually going to build our own paper phonograph in a little bit after I kind of explain the science behind it. So that's basically what you're going to need. Um, okay. I am here. I am listening. If you have questions, just type them in. We'll see if we can get those to me. Um, why don't we start by learning a little bit about Victorian audio technology? It's more than you might expect. Okay, here we go. Let's hope it all works. Crossing our fingers that the technology plays nicely today. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let me just switch over to my presentation. So it all starts, well, more or less starts in 1857. And that's when we have the phonautograph. Now, um, Edward Leon Scott is not often spoken of when we talk about the really big innovations of the Victorian era when it comes to sound, but he actually was the first to figure out a way to take sound waves and vibrations and capture them. So what he did is he took a mirror covered with soot from a candle if you've ever done that, it's a fun thing to do. Um, just get like a piece of glass or a mirror, hold it over a candle that's lit, and you'll see the soot from the candle will cover it, especially in those days. They didn't have really clean burning candles. He then used a needle attached to a diaphragm, which is like the top of a drum, and made a cone and figured out that he could actually make his voice go through that cone, jiggle that diaphragm, which jiggled the needle, and scratched a pattern into the soot. Now, he was doing this as a scientist because he wanted to understand how um, sound worked. So he was looking for things like what changes did pitch make, what changes did loudness make, and things like that. The problem was there was no way to play back your recording. It was scratched into the soot, and that was it. So there was no real commercial you know, use for it, but it was pretty cool. If you want to try something similar, you can, of course, try capturing soot on a mirror. It's a little easier to wrap a toilet paper tube with some foil and practice kind of scratching your own, um, you know, sound waves into it, which brings us to um, the paleophone. Okay. Charles Cross, actually a really nice poet and inventor, did not have a lot of money, <laughs> kind of died in poverty at 45, which is far too often the story for Victorians, but 
he figured out how to use the concept of photo engraving to actually take the ridges from the previous phonograph and make a metal copy of it. And that metal copy could then be reproduced. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't really have the money to patent the idea or, you know, make it a commercial idea. He did write a letter to the French Academy of Sciences. This is a thing that they used to do. You'd write a letter explaining your findings and officially mail it. And that would show that you had an idea at a given time. He got his letter to the French Academy around October. Um, and right about July of that year, a very famous gentleman by the name of Thomas Edison actually had figured out the same thing. So Thomas Edison, of course, had more money. He was able to hire um, a machinist to actually bring his idea to life instead of just a drawing. And so he's the guy that actually came up with the first phonograph that actually could make recordings and play them back. But it was absolutely based on Cross's, um, on a similar idea from Cross. Now, don't feel bad for Cross, okay? His idea becomes very important very soon. But in 1877, everybody was really excited about Edison's phonograph, okay? What he had been working on is a way to take the telegraph, which was using Morse code, you know, dot, dot, dash, dash. We're going to talk more about that at our 1 p.m. Uh, presentation. But he was figuring out ways to basically record those um, telegraph strips, you know, being able to put them in the paper so that you could save them for later. And so that you could double check the people that were writing down the telegraph messages. And he was also trying to figure out a way that you could kind of play them back so you could have like stock telegraph messages. While he was working on this, he wanted to figure out if he could do the same thing for this brand new cool invention from Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone. Basically, he was trying to make the first, you know, voicemail. Well, he took pieces of the telephone and stuck it with pieces of the telegraph and he came up with the phonograph. <laughs> now, this device actually really only used, um, I'm sorry, I'm just checking to make sure no messages. Um, basically, it took a needle and directly carved into a, a wax cylinder, okay, um, to record. And then another needle could go through those grooves, grooves and play the sound back. Edison quickly realized that wax wasn't great for his application and switched to tin foil. And that's what I meant by the previous thing that you could actually put tin foil on a cylinder on a rolling pin or on a toilet paper roll and try this yourself. So this was huge. It was the first time that someone had a machine that could reliably record sound and play it back. Huge innovation, changed everything. There would be no Motown in the future. There'd be no hip hop. There'd be no, you know, huge Grammys every year if it hadn't been for Thomas Edison's really cool invention. But that's not all. Okay. Eventually, his competitor, Alexander Graham Bell, wanted to get into the action too. So he came up with his own version. He realized, based on consumer uh, feedback, that the tinfoil cylinders that Edison was using were really fragile. You couldn't ship them. So an opera in New York couldn't be recorded and shipped to, say, Chicago. The, the cylinders wouldn't survive. So he figured out how to use a really sharp recording stylus that he had specially machined and kind of these wax cylinders that were like really brittle and really hard. And not only did it increase the durability, it made the recording better. So now people could make recordings and share them and ship them out everywhere. Think about that. That was huge. He called his invention the graphophone. Okay, we're probably getting close to words you've heard before. It was a huge success. Edison was so busy with other projects, you know, like inventing electricity and the light bulb, um, that he kind of put the whole recording thing to the side for a while. So Bell was able to get in there, get his graphophone out. It became wildly popular for dictation, basically being able to record what was being said in a meeting or in an academic lecture. All right. Now, a gentleman named Emil Berlinger, got involved pretty soon um, and realized that rather than these cylinders that you had to produce each one, you know, one recording made one cylinder, okay? You couldn't mass produce them. You couldn't copy them. Well, Berlinger went back to Cross's research, okay, and figured out how to 
record to a disc similar to the records we know now, okay? And based on Edison's own process of gold photo engraving, figured out how to make copies of disc recordings. Huge, huge. Now you could take one performance and make hundreds of copies of wax, wax discs, wax records to sell. So he built on Edison and Bell's technology and came up with the gramophone based on his circular flat discs rather than a cylinder. It changed everything, everything, because now anyone could get it, an, a gramophone. It cost about $15 at the time, which was pretty pricey. Um, and they could get these discs and they could share them. Well, <laughs> by 1906, every middle class house, household, every merchant, certainly every upper class household had a gramophone in it and was playing music at parties and um, with their families. It was a huge commercial success. Okay. Um, and it is the reason that eventually records became popular, which led to CD, which led to audio cassettes and then CDs and now downloadable music, which we can thank Babbage for. We'll talk about that later too. All right. So let's talk about actually making the records. Originally, um, the records were made with wax discs building on Bell's technology and a needle actually carved grooves into this disc and that served as a mold. Then they made a gold cast from it. Eventually, they learned that other metals were better for this because gold is actually pretty soft and it, it can only make so many discs. So you make your metal, which is now the reverse of the um, original recording. So it's kind of where there would be grooves. Now there are like little mountains, okay? Then they took that metal version and they pressed it into soft wax, basically stamping into it, embossing into it. Um, and they were able to make new records. So what does this actually look like? This is really cool. Let's see. Here we go. So when you play sound, we are actually wiggling a needle in these grooves. And a very uh, smart scientist figured out how to use an electron microscope to show us what's actually happening. So sound all travels through vibration. And the idea is that these grooves vibrate the needle in the same way that the needle was vibrated when it was recorded. And then you can play that back. So nowadays we have amplifiers and electronic means to do all of this. In the Victorian era, they just had wax. Here's what it looks like up close. This is fascinating. See that? See how it's wiggling in those grooves and it's causing the vibration that will actually generate sound. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Oh, where are we going? <laughs> Sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. Um, now, if you were just to do that, it's just gonna sound like scratching. You're not gonna hear much, okay? There isn't a whole lot of sound generated through that process. You have to amplify it, which is why whenever you see pictures of gramophones or later on Victrolas, which was a commercial product that was based on it, they have these huge horns, okay? Horns are a mechanical way of amplifying sound. Amplification just means makes it louder. Um, so the horn not only helped to direct the sound towards the listener, okay, but it also let that sound bounce around inside that horn and become louder. Okay, that may not make sense. I'm going to lay some science on you. You might remember this from school. That's okay. Let's see. So three quick graphics. As I mentioned, sound is all about vibration, okay? So you can see this if you take a drum, put some rice on it, and whack the drum, you'll see the rice physically move. Sound has to travel in something. That's why there's no sound in space, as they say. Right now, the sound is traveling through the air to the microphone and being made into electronic signal. Um, the taller that wave, okay, the louder the sound. So you can see here in the second graphic, if the amplitude of your wave is small, you have a quiet sound. If the amplitude of your, your wave is taller, higher, you have a louder sound. 
So inside a horn, that little wave that starts down here vibrates and bounces back and forth, and you end up duplicating the waves. And by duplicating the same wave, you make that bigger so it gets louder without changing the pitch. Okay, so I hope that that makes sense. Okay, I'm going pretty quickly through some of the science here because we only have a little time together. But I will have more information on my website for you if you want to learn more about this. And next week, I am doing Friday Steam for the library, totally free. We're really going to delve into pitch and amplitude, okay? So you can come and play with me then. All right. That's basically our science lesson for today. What I think is really cool is a lot of this audio tech is still in use today. I personally still use my record player. Um, you can see that people use uh, megaphones based on the same horn amplification technology, right? We've added electronics, but a lot of the principles are the same. Okay, I am gonna switch views so that we can actually do a little experiment. Let me just make sure, see if I've got any Okay, looks like we're in good shape. So I'm gonna to switch to my document camera and I'm gonna show you how to build your own very simple paper phonograph. So if you have some paper and needles, you could do it right along with me. Otherwise, I'm gonna put all the instructions up on my website and you could do it yourself whenever you feel like it. So switching views, ready? Here we go. Ah, second camera. Okay, turning on the light. Here I have all of my materials. Once again, we need piece of paper, some tape, needles. Um, we're going to need some way to turn our record, so I just use a pencil. I have lots and lots of needles. We're going to talk about that. Um, and, of course, some kind of a record, okay? So I have an old Simon Garfunkel record that's been kind of beaten up. Any record will do. You can get them for a dollar at thrift shops, so I suggest you do that. Um, do not use mom and dad's good records. Oop, let's fix that audio. Is that a little better? I hope that's better. Yeah, don't use mom and dad's good records. Okay, if they're a collector, this is not an experiment you want to do with that stuff. Okay, now let's talk first about our paper. I'm just using a piece of copy paper. It's pretty loose, but you might want to play with and experiment with different thicknesses and types of paper. So you might try construction paper, you might try some scrapbook paper or cardstock, even a brown paper bag. You can also play with the size of the cone we're going to make, the size of your paper. Because here's the thing, the bigger the horn, the louder the sound. <laughs> I know that sounds pretty silly, but we're going to make a very small horn with this. You can make a very big horn with something like newspaper or a paper bag. And the longer that horn, the more that sound is going to bounce around inside there and amplify the sound. So that's something you can really experiment with, and it's really fun. And I'm going to show you a tool to help you do that. Um, the other thing that you can play with, I'm going to leave my paper here so you can see, I have quite a lot of different needles sitting around. Um, different thicknesses of needle are going to give you different results. It's really about finding kind of the best needle to match your, the grooves on your record. Okay, um, I like to start with just kind of your basic tapestry needle because it gives me some space to work with. Okay, so I like something that's pretty long like this um, and is easy to hold. But here's another great spot for you to get to experiment, trying all kinds of different needles to see what works best. You can also use pins if that's what you happen to have on hand. Um, some folks have actually tried these big plastic needles and with certain records, they actually work really well. I like the metal because I think, personally, I think it gives the best vibration, but I leave that for you to, to try, okay? All righty, here we go. We are gonna roll up our paper very simply, like that. Dun -dun -dun. Oops, sorry. Here we go. You want, <laughs> I'm deficient in, in uh, cone making today. So you just roll a little piece of tape to hold it in place if the tape doesn't stick to your fingers. Okay, now we have our horn. If you want to, you can use a pair of scissors to trim that, make it look neat. I know, I'm one of those people that that kind of bugs me if it isn't like nice and neat. You don't have to though. Okay, I've got my horn. I take my needle. You're going to just stick the needle 
see if you can see this, straight on through your horn, okay? So if you could see that, the needle's going right through the horn, okay? And take my record, take my pencil, I stick the pencil right into my record. This is a spot where it's really good to have a bit of help if you uh, are able. Oh, come on, pencil. Sometimes you need a little bit of clay or some tape to make sure it stays where it's supposed to stay. But I find most of them do pretty well. Now, we're going to spin our record like a top, and we're going to use our phonograph in the grooves. Now, different speeds produce different pitches. So it's kind of hard to get the right pitch when you're just playing by yourself. But if you've got a friend, you can. I'm gonna actually aim this here. So maybe the microphone can hear it a little better. Here we go. And the direction matters too. <laughs> that doesn't sound like music. Okay, I'm gonna try spinning the other way. And you can see why we do not use good records for this. One last try. Oh, well, that was nice. I hope that's picking up on the mic. But that's the basic idea. And from there, you can experiment to get the best results. I also want to mention that if you want to really test with numbers, your um, creation here, you can get a free app called Science Lab. It's for both Android and um, you know, iPhone. It's made by Google. And what it has is the ability to track a bunch of in interesting data, like it has a decibel meter. So if I'm talking very softly, or if I'm talking really loudly, it will record that for you. So if you wanna try your different horns to see which gives you the most decibels and the most loudness, you can do that using your cell phone. All right, coming back over here. We are just about done, my friends, almost done. All right, so thank you so much for hanging in there. I know that we need to switch over to the next folks. I took a little too long, but it was so good to see you. I will see you again at one o'clock. Um, again, my name is Sandy Roberts. I am from Kaleidoscope in Richmond and the Warren County Public Library System. We've got lots of fun for you this weekend. Make sure you visit my website for lots of other great ideas and for templates and more information on the projects that you saw today. All right, take care. I will see you soon.